Great. So, hello everybody. Welcome back to uh, quantum computation after a two-week break uh, due to uh, mid-sem uh, different schedules of mid-sem non-overlapping schedules of uh, MSc and BTEC students. So, um, in the mid-sem for this class, there was one question that I asked about what is the complexity of of a program. Right, and how would you describe it in your own words? So we are having a discussion on that. And uh, so the the uh, analogy that I uh, let me just perform the formalities. Lecture nineteen, February still February, right? Two thousand twenty two. Complexity. So, uh, so I, I, so the question that I would ask ask you is, how do you how do you make a cake? Okay, go for it. Bola gather all the raw ingredients required. Gather ingredients. Okay. What ingredients? Eggs, uh, flour. Eggs. Yes. Eggs. Okay, great. <laughs> Gather eggs. Where do eggs come from? Poultry farm. You you have direct access to poultry farm? Uh, not actually. Murgi ke khet ke pakel mein rehte hain. No, from the shop. <laughs> From the shop, right? Okay. And presumably from the poultry farm. But where where do they come from? From, from the poultry farm, right? They come from the chicken. So the so the point is, right? That. What is complexity? Complexity, if we say, is the if we define it roughly as the number of steps required to to solve a problem, right? To solve a problem or to perform a computation. The question is, what should be a step? Right? Is this a step? Is right. How small, how far, minute, to what minute, minute scale should you go? Right. So if I keep following this argument that that I'm I'm, I've been writing down that the chicken go, the poultry farm has a chicken and the the chicken there's a rooster and the rooster and the chicken uh, they you know, um, have a party and. Um, the chicken ends up uh, pregnant. Well, actually, that's not how they do it in, in 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 poultry farm. But you get the general idea. But then one could say, well, uh, what happens to the how is the egg formed inside the chicken, right? Then you would go to the level of uh, this thing. Uh, what is it? Cellular biology, right? And then you would go to even smaller. You could go down to atomic scale, right? And then if you went to atomic scale, you would ask, where do atoms come from? Well, you, you would talk about nucleosynthesis. Right? And you'd say, where does nucleosynthesis come from? Well, you, you'd say the Big Bang. Well, you, you, you'd say stars, right? Atoms are formed in stars. How do stars form? Stars from, from gravitational collapse. of dust clouds, right? Dust and other matter clouds, right? So you could go all the way back to the Big Bang just to make your cake, right? But clearly this is somewhat facetious, right? This is, because why is it? So 
So the point I'm trying to make, it's not the absolute number of steps that is required to solve a problem, but it's the relative number of steps. Okay, so you have to have some starting, some baseline. You have your some some sort of a baseline that is given to you, right? So, for instance, in the case of making a cake, what is that baseline? The baseline is that the ingredients are provided to you, right? That the cooking apparatus is provided to you, right? etc with this baseline in mind now one can ask right what are the steps required to make different kinds of cakes for instance you know i could ask how many steps are required to make a red velvet cake right or how many steps are required i don't have a a chocolatey color pencil here. So I'll just use black. How many steps are required, right? For a black forest cake. Right? So let's say this number is N2, right? And this number is N1. then you can make a comparison right you can say okay n1 is less than n2 which means that uh, black forest cakes are more complex than red velvet one right so you have to have some starting point, some baseline, right? But once you have that baseline, then you can ask, okay, what is the relative complexity of achieving two different uh, goals, right? Um, in the case of coding, uh, um, so we refer to this as uh, so we characterize problems in terms of how much computational uh, how many computational resources are required to to solve them right so if if you talk about some we can we can ask in a similar way what is the complexity of a quantum state right so many of our problems what they what they what you have seen is that the solution of the problem basically involves being able to uh, create a quantum circuit which can give you which can generate a certain state starting from some initial point, right? Now what, and once you have created that final state, then generally that is your solution. You perform some measurements on it and so on and so forth, right? But now the question is, so if you want to talk about the complexity of, of, of a quantum state, right? Of You have two different states, right? You have psi one and psi two. Right, and let's say these these two are uh, this thing. They are states on in H n, okay, where n is the Hilbert space of of n qubits, right? So if you have n qubit, what are the basis? What are the basis elements, right? Basis elements. You have n qubits, so you have a. What is the dimensionality of your Hilbert space? It's a two to the n dimensional 
right? Vector space. Because and 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 what are the possible uh, what are what are these basis vectors? These basis vectors can be labeled in this way, right? Where each of these elements x1 to xn takes values in zero or one, or you can also say that x each of these values takes takes value. You know, instead of saying zero and one, you can also say up and down or red and blue or whatever, it doesn't matter. You have two distinguishable outcomes, right? And so if you look at all the possibilities, you get two to the n such vectors, right? So this is a basis vector, which I will just write as, as x. Then any state in my, in my system, any state of my system can be written as a, superposition of these basis states, right? So I can write some coefficient, right? Which depends on these n, on the state of these n qubits. And then this sum is over all xi in zero and one, right? But alternatively, you know by now, that any such state corresponds to a binary representation of a number, right? So we can also, and how, which numbers are there? The numbers, we can label them from zero to two n minus one. So we can also write it as, actually this is not a vector, let me write it as a number. We can also write it as a number x, Right, which goes from zero to n minus one, c x, x. Right, so this is this is any state. Right now, one can ask. So, if you want to ask, what is the complexity of psi one, or what is the complexity of psi two? Right. So, the rel the important the way to ask the question is not what is the absolute complexity, okay? But the relative complexity. Now, this is something that we already are familiar with in physics, right? Can anybody tell me in which part of physics uh, is, this, is this the case? That we cannot define something at, with using an absolute scale. Uh, can anybody tell me this? Potential. Right, potential. Right, potential of, or more, more precisely, in the case of energy, right? So when we talk about, when we talk about the definition of energy, of two states, right? What we mean is the, the quantity of interest is the relative energy, right? That is what is measurable. This is the measurable quantity because you can always take E1 and add to it some arbitrary constant and add the same arbitrary constants to E2, but delta E will be unchanged, right? So these two quantities, E1 and E2, have this freedom, right? In physics, such a freedom is sometimes referred to as a gauge freedom. And when you uh, mod out that, that gauge freedom, whatever you're left with, that is your measurable quantity. So similarly, okay, and now of course, when we are talking about some system, about some physical system, how do we refer to the to the energy? Well, we define a 
what we call a vacuum state, right? We define a vacuum state, which is the state of lowest energy. So we are assuming that there is such a state. If there is no state which has lowest energy, then our system is unstable, right? And uh, then we have to deal with it in other ways. But in most systems that we know, we can always define such a state of lowest energy, right? And then we define the, the energy of any state with respect to the, this vacuum state, right? So we say En, the energy of any state, what is it? It's actually the En minus E naught, right? Where, where this, this E, that I, this E of N is what I have here, is some absolute value of the energy, right? Both of these. But uh, we don't, we only care about the difference, right? So we, we take the difference and we, we, another way to say it is that we set E, e naught to zero. We set the lowest energy to zero, right? So similarly, for complexity. Right? If we have some state and we want to find the complexity of that state, so complexity of, let's say, psi, psi 2, right? Or complexity of psi 1. How do we, how do, we do so? Well, we have to define a state of minimum complexity. Right? And again, this is some sort of a vacuum, right? Because the vacuum is, is uh, something which by definition is empty, right? It's very, it's the simplest possible state that you can have. And then you can have excitations in the vacuum, right? So you imagine the surface of, 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 of an ocean and the water is completely still, right? And then you drop a, a very small stone. It sets, up, it sets up a wave which ripples. That is an excitation, right? And so in this way, what you can do is you can drop bigger stones and more and more stones and build up bigger and bigger excitation, right? So we define a state of minimum complexity. So for the n qubit case, for the n qubit state, we can, we can define this state to be just the state which consists of all zero or also we can write it as all up spin. See, again, I'm saying that zero corresponds to an up spin and one corresponds to a down spin. Uh, that is also convention, right? It doesn't have to be that way, but so just keep in mind, this is a convention. So once we have this, right, then we can ask, right, What is the complexity of some other state with respect to psi naught, right? With respect to the baseline complexity. Right? So again, in exact analogy with this, we would define the the complexity of some state, and I label my states with some integer n or some number and it doesn't matter. It could be the difference in the right. So the, this would be some kind of an absolute complexity. But of course, we don't have any such quantity. 
and we don't need any such quantity, right? And so I hope that this, uh, and we can set C C naught to zero, right? So now the question is, so is this clear so far? Are there are there any any questions about any of this? No, sir. So now one can ask, once you have this vacuum state, how do you define the complexity of any other state with respect to it? So there is a very, very simple way of doing that, which is the following. So your vacuum state is this, where all your initial qubits are initialized in the, in the zero state, right? And your output state, whatever it is, right, is some psi, where all your qubits are in some superposition, right? They are entangled or whatever, right? But it's not something very simple, obviously. So now one can ask, if I start acting on these qubits with unitary gates, Okay. And I act with uh, so I can ask how many such gates are required. to create the state psi, right? This is one measure of the complexity. We can call that complexity of psi, right? But again, one has to be careful, right? Why is that? Because if you look at all of these unitary gates, if you look at the whole circuit, you can treat the whole circuit as one big unitary gate, right? Because that, that's what any circuit is, right? It's a unitary transformation. So you would say that, well, number of gates is equal to one, but uh, this is wrong, obviously, right? And the reason is because this gate itself can be written as a as a product of smaller gates, right? So then the question becomes, uh, what are the smallest possible gates, right? So you have to you have to identify the set of elementary gates or operations, right? And then in terms of those operations, you have to ask how to, how many such operations does it take to generate time? Okay, but now there is one more subtlety. What is that subtlety? Can anybody think of it? Can anybody tell me what other issue might crop up? Assuming that, well, this is what I'm doing. I'm using, I'm counting just the number of elementary gates, nothing else. What might, what other issue might I face? Any any ideas, any thoughts on this? Which Sir, one? error, error. If you uh, increase the number of hardware gates. No, 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 but, but, but we are not talking about, we're talking about an ideal circuit. 
we're not we're not we're we're not we're saying there are no sources of error right then there are no sources of error in this uh, we're not taking error into account okay uh but i mean there is there you have a point in that uh in the real world of course uh you will have to take error into account right so if you want to ask what is the complexity of a quantum state in the real world you have to take you have to and uh, there will be a certain amount of irreducible errors so you have to take into account the error correction apparatus that is required to generate you know to, to account for that but the, once you do that right so if, if you in, if you include error correction into the picture so i include error correction into the picture now how do i typically include error correction well we haven't talked about error correction but we'll to be we'll be talking about that next because it's the most important topic is that so these are your n qubits right and this this is your output state so typically how what one does is you introduce certain ancilla qubits okay these are called ancilla qubits or degrees of freedom ancilla just means extra or additional or assistant right and you couple these uh, degrees of freedom in a suitable manner uh, with uh, you know that there, there are there are some operations connecting these different uh, each qubit and uh, these degrees of freedom that right we'll we'll be talking about all the various possible schemes later on this is one way right so but again the question comes down to the following once i have included error correction in the picture right the question will reduce to the same thing right you identify this number of elementary gates required to to implement the state right create the the state taking and my writing i know is terrible taking error correction into account so obviously if i if i say what is the the complexity of the state psi right uh, with errors right this will be greater than the complexity of the state otherwise right let's call that a perfect perfect complexity or something like that so something like this for instance happens in thermodynamics uh this is this is i'm going slightly uh away from what i was talking about but it's this is also an a very important point is that the, the analogy that you can make here is with thermodynamics now can anybody tell me what what analogy am i thinking of uh mega can you uh think of anything like this in uh in thermodynamics or sana not sure sir maybe entropy maybe entropy okay uh no not entropy okay 
Uh, Papu, do you have any idea what uh, thermodynamics, what quantities are there? So what are the quantities in, in thermodynamics? Can anybody tell me? The, the principal, uh, what do you call it? Uh, thermodynamic potentials, as they are called, which describe any system. Somuk? Well, I'm not sure for what, uh, how to get it. I'm not sure, to, I'm not able to- For, for any, in thermodynamics, Thermodynamics. What 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 are the quantities we calculate? Uh, into enthalpy, internal energy. Enthalpy. Heat, what else? Heat or Gibbs free energy. Heat free energy, right? Free energy. What is free energy? Energy available to do work. Exactly. This is the amount of energy that is available for doing useful work. right this is less this is typically less than or equal to the total internal energy right which is denoted by u let's say and there are different kinds of free energies there is the helmholtz free energy there is the gibbs free energy which is it uh, i think it's written as a letter g and then there is the free free energy which is just f so you have these different measures of of energy which correspond to the energy which is available for doing useful work and this is typically less than the total energy of the system right similarly the analogy that i'm trying to make here is that when you when you talk about the complexity of uh, a system of a state with and without the error correcting part taken into account, right? Uh, that is similar to this situation, right? Uh, the, uh, the roles are reversed because uh, free energy is less than the available energy. Here, complexity is greater than the, uh, the actual complexity is greater than the, uh, so maybe one can define the free energy of circuit. Free energy of a circuit, right? You would define it as minus of this complexity of the circuit with error correction. Okay, anyway, this is, we still have to come back to this question, identify the number of elementary gates required to create the state. So here now, now there is some ambiguity. There is, a, there is a potential for some ambiguity. What ambiguity can there be? Can somebody think of it and, and tell me? Right, so I have said, identify the number of elementary gates required to build a circuit. Um, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it going to be true that there will always be just one way to, to do so? No, different ways can require different number of elementary gates. No, but you could have a smallest possible number of elementary gates, right? And you could have more than one way to generate the same state with the with that with that smallest number of elements. Right. So that's the ambiguity that one has to take into account. But again, uh, if you talk about the complexity, and again you talk about it in some thermodynamic limit, that is, you talk about when the number of limits, number of qubits in a system becomes very large. Uh, so in that case. Uh, that that uh, ambiguity will average off. Okay, so I I hope that I have given you guys an idea of of the notion of complexity. Now there is a notion of complexity classes. Okay, which makes this uh, 
which makes this into a more 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 precise uh, subject uh, right uh, a mathematical uh, field of study rather than rather than something that is that just has a qualitative description right uh, so so these uh, this is known as computational complexity and i had talked about it in the beginning of the semester right there is the there is the notation in terms of o big o notation right uh, so but i i'm not going to go into that in in any great detail over here okay but if anybody has any questions please you can ask me so for that o part like uh, which is included in bracket uh, is uh, do we refer to them as nodes like uh, usual or can we use some other term with uh, physical uh, quantum computation uh you mean again for the mid term right one second let me let me just uh open the the final right so i asked provide uh, two examples of uh, provide examples of two problems one which requires polynomial time and one which requires exponential time right um so so what is what is the question again sir so like we uh, in, uh, re referred the steps to as nodes in uh, artificial intelligence so how do we refer to m the uh... men artificial intelligence where is artificial intelligence coming into this picture so like that uh, so i am asking no, no, like don't 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 introduce uh, things which are not like required so, okay yeah yeah. Uh, yeah no i'm just asking that what is, uh, mm -hmm. what is the term used for the quantity included in the brackets following the o the n that is this n the number of elementary operations required whether for classical or for a uh, a uh, quantum algorithm right uh, that was the question yeah so um so two example two example examples of two such problems one which requires exponentially many operations which is scaled exponentially is uh, the factorization of 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 large numbers of number of any number so this is a problem in which the complexity goes as um uh so o to the o this this o n function it, it's an exponential and um, so that corresponds to a non polynomial problem and an example of a polynomial scale is something like addition of two numbers right so the addition uh, requires if you have two numbers one has n1 digits and the other has n2 digits and let's say n2 is greater than n1 then the maximum number of operations you require to add those two numbers is bounded by n2 right plus maybe something plus a few extra operations to keep track of uh, carry over uh, of of in of digits and so on so right so you can take any two very very big integers and, and you can add them very very quickly uh the same thing is true for multiplication also again it will go as a polynomial in in the size of the integer but finding the factors of any 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 integer is a non polynomial problem right okay any other question okay then in that case i'll stop here for today um all right and uh, we'll meet again on on wednesday uh and we'll talk about um we will probably start talk 
talking about uh, error correction. Okay. So I'll see you then. All right. Bye bye. Thank right. you, sir. Thank you, sir.